We turn our hearts towards this fall season, and we are going to take a look at God in a brand, not a brand new way, because the Word of God reveals Him as such, but we're going to talk about Jesus Christ and God and how He's revealed Himself in this this amazing God that is both infinitely large. He is God, sovereign, all-seeing, all-knowing, yet he is God intimate, deeply connected and relational to us. And we are gonna unpack this and we're gonna do our best to engage in who God is so that we may no longer bear the excuse that maybe, well, he's just too distant and we don't know if we can trust him. We are going to know God, hopefully in a brand new way. Today we start our series, Infinite and Intimate. And we're going to use the gospel of John to help us understand God and really help us answer some questions. Because I don't know about you, but sometimes I step back and I'm like, isn't there more to life than this? Than this madness and this chaos that seems to rule over us. And I think scripture says there is. I think, I know scripture says there is. And I know the biblical witness from arcing from the beginning of history to the end of history in the future, God has a plan and God speaks speaks his plan very clearly. I want to read again with you what, um, what we just heard, part of that. Um, it's the opening of the Gospel of John, John chapter 1. And it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. One of the things we as the church have to grab onto and understand is that throughout history, there has been one thing. It has all been about one thing. One, singular. And what we have to do as the church is have the discipline and fortitude to set our eyes on that one thing and understand not only who God is, but who he intends to be in a relationship with us and what it does to us in being that re- in that relationship. We recognize that in the beginning was the word. And we understand that th- to hear that phrase, John, the apostle John says those words, he pens those words, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. And sometimes we can open a gospel and just say it and be like, that's weird, but okay, I trust it. But what if we actually looked at it and recognized that in the beginning, it was about one thing. And in the middle of all history, it's been about one thing. And at the end of all time, it'll still be about that same one thing. In the beginning was the word. In the beginning was the word. The first word of creation, the first word of creation and the light of the world. We need to understand the magnificence of who Jesus Christ is. We need to understand the the largeness of it. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. And let's just think for a minute of what it sounds like to take John 1 and slide it and look at Genesis 1 through the lens of John 1. Genesis 1 says, in the beginning, the Lord created the heavens and the earth. Now, darkness covered the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters, which is chaos. The Spirit of God hovered over the mad chaos of primordial creation. And into that darkness and into that chaos, a word was spoken. A word was spoken. We know that scripture says, let there be light is the word. But what if we reframe something real quick? What if the first word spoken was the light? Have you ever thought of it that way? What if the first words of creation was the light? And that light was the light of all humanity. What if in the beginning we answer the question, who is the word? What if we find out right here, right now, that in the beginning was the word, and that word was Jesus, and he is the very first word of creation. He is the light that gives life to all. He is the word made flesh. John goes on to say that Jesus Christ, the word who was present at creation, was also the word in flesh, made into a person, and that person was Jesus. What if we understood just for a moment that that one thing, 
the center point of all history, is still at work and alive and active in his church today as he was when he was the first word spoken at creation. How amazing does our life start to feel when we realize that the words that started it all is the word being spoken over us. So let's take a minute today and let's understand that there is one point to history. And the biblical text gives witness to this and we understand that when we say who is the word and the answer is Jesus Christ is the word, then we better stop and pay close attention to this infinitely creative God who created all things, yet the very same God who came down and became your savior and mine. There is an amazing complexity to who Jesus Christ is, but he reveals himself in the person of Christ who came down, and John writes of him. So today, we recognize the point of history in scripture and in life is Jesus Christ. All things from the beginning pointed towards Jesus, and all things in that sense his life have pointed back, have pointed back to Jesus. So we today get a chance to grab on and understand maybe there's a bigger picture. So we're going to do some broad strokes today with the Old Testament and the New Testament and just take a look at the breadth, the width, the depth of who Jesus is and then the personal connectivity of it. So the Word of God, before Christ came to earth, the Word of God was revealed. God reveals that there's this Word that's being spoken and what the Word revealed is doing is calling back his creation to himself. God is calling back to himself his creation. And how does he do this? By giving distinction. It's really kind of amazing. Did you ever think about that in the creative order? If everything is darkness and everything is black, what happens when there's no light? Has anybody ever walked through your hallway and there was a misplaced vacuum in the middle of the night and you have lovingly merged your toes with that vacuum not knowing it was there and your, your pinky now points that way and you're like, why? You know, I should have turned on a light. I should have had distinction. In the beginning, the Lord created the heavens and the earth and his first word was let there be light and there was light and God said there is night and there is day and he separated them and he created distinction. He created this sense of clarity. He gave order and distinction to the chaos. Now, I don't know about you, but after my first week in school with our family, a little bit of order and distinction would be nice in the chaos, right? Oh, so you guys all had good weeks, first week of school? Or you're just going to stare at me and be mean? Because, I mean, we had a good week, but it was rough. Like, it's crazy getting everybody back on a schedule. And there's this chaos going on. And we sit there and we put on a nice Christian face and we sit in church like, amen. And then we leave back into the chaos not thinking God's interested. What if God's interested? What if God has always been, since the beginning of time, speaking light, life, order, and distinction? Just think with me through creation. This is why the church can't lose the creation narrative. Because if we're not creative, created by God and in his image, then this is a weird mess. But we are. And creation says that God starts with light. Then he separates earth and sky. Then he separates land and sea. And then he separates things that creep on the ground and things that walk on the ground. Things that walk on the ground from the things that fly above it. He separates and creates distinction and order in his created world. And then when creation falls into sin, what does God do? He starts redoing the same thing over. There was this old man named Abraham who God would call back to himself. Now, if you're in the church and I said, Father Abraham, you just want to stand up and be like, have me any sons? And you start going, anybody else sing that song? Yeah, you did. Have me any sons had Father Abraham. We're just like pumping the arm and I am one of them. And so, and if you're not in church, you're like, dang it, I'm in a cult. No, we're not. I promise we're not a cult. But here's the thing. We understand that God began calling people back to himself at Abraham. He called out to him, Abraham, go to a land that you don't know but trust me, I'm with you. I'm calling you. Abraham responds, and God gives him a son, Isaac. And Isaac has two sons, one of them being Jacob, whom the Lord loved. Jacob has 12 sons. 
And this is where things start getting really kind of cool. God's calling his people back to himself. But when God finally gets a hold of Jacob and his 12 sons, they are so rooted in their culture and context, God actually allows them to be sent into slavery in Egypt for 400 years. And he removes any identity they may have, independent of their master. And then when God frees them through the prophet Moses, he gives them the law. He gives them the law. Why would God give the law to these 12 tribes of people? Jacob's 12 sons are the 12 tribes of Israel. Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Judah, Benjamin, all these different tribes are named after the sons of Jacob. Why would God give the law to these 12 tribes? What if God was creating order and distinction for his people in the chaotic near Middle East? that was completely pantheistic in the day. Multiple gods, thousands of gods. And God was creating for himself a place where they would be set apart and their living would reveal something true of God. Oh, what if God, using the words, calling Abraham back to himself, calling Abraham's son, calling the tribes of Israel back to himself was to be done in order that they would be set apart that they would not be the same as everyone else and that the way they live would be ordered and distinct and reveal part of who God is. What if that was was true? I'll tell you this. The biblical witness says it's absolutely true. And here's one of the really cool parts of it. Scripture's not done repeating itself. How many disciples did Jesus have? Twelve. He had 12 disciples. And what was the purpose of their life? Remember, God called Abraham an ordinary guy out of obscurity and into greatness, into a relationship with Almighty God. Didn't that happen with the disciples? Think about it with me. Didn't that happen with the disciples? They're sitting there fishing, not the fun kind with a bass boat and stuff. No, they're fishing with the nets and the small boats and trying to make a living with fish. And Jesus says, hey, out of obscurity, follow me, Peter, follow me. And these obscure, no-named people in the middle of history become the 12 apostles who were called to become a distinct people who trust in the name of Jesus Christ so that their life may be distinct and give witness to something God's doing. God's doing the same thing again, isn't he? He's doing this again and again. And the reality is he's doing it in his church even today. Even today. The problem is we keep missing the one thing. The one thing that keeps whoosh right over our head. And no longer can the church rest on its laurels and say, well, historically we're good. I think we cannot do that anymore. We can't miss the one thing. Who here saw the movie The Sixth Sense? Anybody? Anybody? Yeah, first of all, it disturbed me deeply. Um, I'm not good for scary movies. I'm a gigantic coward, and I, I can't stand it. But I did see this movie. And at the end, when Bruce Willis is dead, I'm like, what? He's dead? And Erica looks at me with tenderness in her eyes. She wasn't judging me, but she was like, oh, I married one of those. Like, it just was very sad. She was like, you didn't know he was dead? I'm like, how could he be dead? He's been talking to the boy, but he sees dead people. What? I couldn't get it. I missed the one thing. And at the end of the movie, I was like, this is super duper frustrating. Because now I'm trying to unpack all I've seen and realize, that M. Night Shyamalan is a trickster. And I was very angry about it. But what if we as the church have missed the one thing? That the Lord Jesus Christ is the very first word of creation. He will have the final word over creation. And until then, he is the word spoken, spoken over us. By his blood we are redeemed. How sad to miss that point because that is who we are. It is who we're called to be and we recognize in the lives of the disciples that he was their all in all. They left everything to follow him. Our job is not so much really one yet of obedience, it's of proper recognition of who Jesus is. John 1, 9 to 12 says the true light that gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. And he was in the world. And though the world was made through him, 
the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to be called children of God. Let me ask you a question. Is anybody here a parent? A few of us? Yeah, I saw your kids run. Some more hands should have gone up. Or you're very fertile. That's awesome. All right. So we have parents. Anybody here a child? This is a test. I'm, I'm not lying. This is a t- you're all children, actually. If you didn't raise your hand, you need to go back to biology. Um, so we're all children. Here's the thing. Do you have an image of maybe your dad that nobody else has? Yeah, you, one hand, the dad's like, don't you ever speak. And you know, no, don't participate down the front row. All right, so you have an image of your dad that's different than the rest of the world. Why? Because you live with him. And you know he's crazy. He may put on a good face for the world, but the man loses his mind at times. My children have this father too. And they're like, oh yeah, you can call him Pastor Eric, but dad's a little weird at times. They know me differently. They are children of Eric Folkers. Their relationship with him is altogether different. Why isn't it so for the church? We have been given the right to know God as our heavenly father through Jesus Christ. We should know these kind of quirky, incidental things about God because of our relationship with him. It should not come as a surprise to us that God is at work in this world in such a way to reveal the Father's heart and show us how much we as his children get to be close. But we make it a formal religious experience, and I think Scripture says this infinitely massive God is deeply relational and seeking to connect and redeem with that which has been separated. So for you and I, we have to look at this and say, okay, if God is this amazing word-made flesh, the word of God, the first word of creation, Jesus Christ, is also the Jesus that I bow my head and pray to at night, how do I even fully engage this? I want to do something in our application today to free you up. I want to say, first of all, questions are okay. It's okay to ask your questions in this place. It's okay to come here and say, okay, I don't have it all figured out. Now, I need you to participate with me, and I, and I know it's hard, and I promise I'll try not to call anybody out because it's fun to tease, but I, I promise I won't. Does anybody here ever have questions about your faith but you're scared to ask? Notice my hands up. I do. I don't have it all figured out. And you guys are like, oh, no, we were following you. That's on you. That's not my fault. That's on you. I don't have it figured out. I am not a good, pious, religious relic. I don't have my life perfectly in order. And I make mistakes sometimes that are embarrassing to me, and it's hard. If you've got it all worked out, please attend a different church. It makes me feel bad to have you in the room. I don't have it together. I have questions, and I ask them. But we as a church often feel like we don't know where to bring our questions. So I'm going to invite you to something. You may ask, why are we doing Alpha? The reason we're doing Alpha is you can't raise your hand in this room and be like, hey, yeah, Pastor Eric, I was wondering, on that word thing, everybody would be like, why are they standing and talking in church? That's not how it works, right? But if you're at a table with 10 people and you're all eating something and talking and someone says, hey, I have a question. Nobody's like, that's out of place. It feels natural. It feels normal. It's okay to come here with your questions and learn and grow into the image of him who we love. This sovereign, almighty, omnipotent God loves us. And he is fully embodied in Jesus Christ and wants to know us. Bring your questions. What better place to come than the church where we have the word of God, his scriptures, is our binding influence and everything we adhere to And we have the Spirit-filled church. Those who are in Christ are filled with the Holy Spirit. How amazing to be at a table with people who adhere to the Word of God and are biblically faithful, but also are filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, according to John 14 and 15, is the Spirit of Jesus Christ, which is the Spirit of the Word, and the Word interprets our lives. And maybe we can find questions together. Maybe we can ask a question and not be like, heretic, Or we could be like, ooh, I've been wondering that too. Why do we baptize infants? 
Why do we do this? Why don't you know? Ask them. Come and ask questions and don't feel judged. If you plan on judging people at Alpha, I would like to invite you to Beta. It's outside and you can't come to it and ruin it for other people. You can't do that because questions are welcome here. We believe that the word desires to not only redeem, but to connect with us. This almighty God intends to know us well and for us to know him well. The next thing is this. Read the Bible. Read the word. Now, here's the deal. When I say that, you probably feel a little bit like, you know, when you see an anaconda eat a buffalo and you're like, wow, isn't that how you approach scripture sometime? Today I will read James and you swallow it whole and you're like, well, that is weird and I don't know what to do with it. Anybody ever have that when you read something in the Bible where Samson eats honey out of a lion's carcass and you're like, do not know how that applies to my life. That seems really weird. Here's the deal. You're not snakes. We don't unhinge our jaw and swallow it whole. What do we do? We prepare food, and then we take it, and we chew on it. We chew on it. It feels weird to swallow something whole. I was in Thailand eating uh, at a church thing, and they had put little quail eggs into it. Anybody ever have a quail egg? What up, Q? Thank you, Erica. She, um, my wife and I, I guess we eat quail eggs. Um, but I was sitting there, I was eating it, and it was a slippery little guy, and I'm like, oh, oh. Oh, there's a whole egg just sitting inside me. I felt like a confused chicken. It just felt weird. You know, it, it's not, it didn't feel right going down. And I had to struggle. I was, you know, I was kind of like, oh. And I looked, I'm like, did anybody else see me kind of joke? And thankfully they didn't. But then I'm just sitting there, I'm like, oh. It's not meant to be swallowed whole for us. The word of God is not this thing we swallow whole. We take it and we sit down like a very carefully crafted meal. And we take it and we chew and we enjoy and we process and we meditate. And sometimes you can even sit there and write about it. That's how it's supposed to be. It's not supposed to be like, how much can I eat? It's supposed to be something a little more like a chef on iron, a judge on Iron Chef, taking in every element, enjoying it, chew on it, enjoy the word of God, quit trying to swallow it whole. Here's your homework this week. Get into John chapter one. And take a bite. Just take a bite. And don't try to swallow it whole. Don't hurry through it. Sit and chew on it. What does it mean that the very first word of creation is Jesus? And what does it mean that that amazing light, distinction, amazing almighty God is also the person you call out to to forgive you for every individual sin you ever committed? How amazing is that? Chew on that for a little while and enjoy that this gospel is not something we just take in. It's something we, we digest. We meditate on it. I would invite you to read John chapter one this week and maybe take some paper and a pen and take some notes on what you think. Maybe some of your questions. Ask it. Chew on it. And when it's right, swallow it down and take it into your life. Let it give life to your bones. The very first part of digestion is chewing and I believe it's true in the spiritual as much as it is in the physical. We need to chew on these things. The third thing is this, and this is really, really, really cool. The word is still calling. The word of God called Abraham out of obscurity and into a life where we will march and sing a song about how many sons he has. And the word continued calling people out of obscurity into light, out of the darkness. And it called the disciples. The disciples had their life set. What are you doing today, Peter? Fishing. What are you doing tomorrow? Fishing. It's what I do forever. What are you doing, Matthew? Collecting taxes. That's what he was going to do. They had their life plan set. And Jesus Christ, into obscurity, called their name. And everything changed. Into their chaos, the light of the world came and revealed to them that their life was worth far more than the fish they catch, the money they make, or the things they have. Their life was to give witness to the one who created them. How much better did your life just get? How much better did your life just get because the word is still calling regular, random, obscure people out of Herman Miller, Hayworth, construction companies, lawyers' offices, colleges, schools, everything. God's still calling. The word of God is still calling. Will we listen and respond faithfully? You saw three lives that are listening and responding faithfully today. 
It's taking them away from a life they knew out of obscurity into a faithful proclamation of who Jesus Christ is. My friends, I have no better news than this for you today. The word, the Lord Jesus Christ knows your name and he's calling you according to his purposes. How now shall you live? Pray with me. Lord, into the chaotic waters of our lives, we pray that you would speak. We pray that you, infinite God, this God who is above all, in all, through all things, would speak clearly our names and get our attention. And that we would dare to step out into the great unknown where we can't really keep ourselves up and standing tall, but we depend on you. Come, Lord Jesus Christ, the word made flesh, and show us not only how you are the centerpiece of history, but how you are also the God who is calling our name. May our lives live as faithful witness to your life, death, and resurrection. Lord Jesus Christ, may we give witness to you and you only. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, would you join me as we stand and sing? So many of us spend our lives wondering if there's more to life than this. And I will tell you this, there is. There absolutely is. There's more than the chaos that tries to swallow you whole. There's more than the madness of trying to gain more for yourself. There is one who from the beginning has been enough, who has been all we ever wanted. There is the Lord Jesus Christ. The reason we know that the calling of God is satisfying is because the 12 disciples who left altogether normal and good lives were willing to die in various ways, all of them, except for the apostle John died a martyr's death because Jesus was not only worth living for, he was worth living to the point of death for. There was nothing that wasn't worth living for Jesus. And if you find yourself today in a place where you're like, I just need my faith and my life to have meaning, you have heard the name of the one who gives it all that and more, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't know him, don't leave today without coming down. I will pray with you after the service, and you can accept him as your Lord and Savior. My friends, our lives are to be distinct and different, and the chaos doesn't own us. The Lord Jesus Christ does. May your lives, as you go from this place, give witness to him who has given you purpose and identity above the chaos of this world. Amen? Amen. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it is time for the church to leave the building because you are dismissed.